All righty. Um, thank you, Dr. Chapman, for the uh, nice introduction. And thank you to Dr. Escudian, too. It's really great to be back. As Dr. Chapman mentioned, this is where I did my fellowship. Um, and it's a real honor and privilege to be speaking here today. So um, as Dr. Chapman mentioned, Wyatt Ramey, I'm a neurosurgeon at Houston Methodist in Texas. And this morning, I'll be talking about revisiting classifications for spinal cord injury. And we'll look at some of the things that have gone on in the past, some of the things we're doing now, and then possibly some directions for the future. Um, so why do we have classifications in healthcare to begin with? Well, one is it provides a really easy way for us to communicate as physicians. So us as spine surgeons, we can communicate easily with the ER or the traumatologist, the intensivist, and that allows us to practice medicine efficiency and with simplicity. Um, and, you know, time and resources are always uh, of the essence, especially uh, nowadays. Uh, and lastly, I think one of the possibly one of the most important pieces to classification systems is that it uh, allows us to perform high quality research studies um, and really spit out alphanumeric uh, uh, data to provide meaningful outcomes-based research. So as far as classification systems as they relate to spinal cord injury, well, why do we need them? And in, along very similar lines, well, spinal cord injury is, is a very heterogeneous disease. We've got cervical, thoracic, lumbar, incomplete, complete injuries, central cord syndrome, all of those behave uh, very differently. So we need to have a unified language uh, in order to uh, convey uh, the spectrum of spinal cord injury. And it allows us also to have a prognostic tool to examine the nat natural history of spinal cord injuries. And lastly, we can use these classifications in our research studies to determine uh, treatment efficacies. And it's been about 100 years or so of modern day treatment of spinal cord injury and after decompression was, was discovered, you know, there, there's really only been, I would say, marginal improvement after decompression was discovered. Uh, although, uh, as Dr. Hurlbert and Dr. Robbie have gone over, uh, there, there have been some advances, but we haven't made a, a tremendous dent in, in spinal cord injury. Um, this slide is sort of in jest, but I can make fun of it because I have been guilty of some of these things in one form or, or another. But some of the real reasons for about half or, or so of the classification systems in healthcare, and, and one of those reasons is assumption. You know, the, a surgeon or a medical center will find their classification tool or their system useful, and so they automatically assume that everybody else will. And so they go out and publish that, and people love to publish. Uh, it increases their H indices, it increases the number of their citations, and lastly, it really feeds into their ego. And um, you develop that sense of name recognition, that sense of legacy um, in your field. And um, again, th this is important to recognize because it allows us to distinguish what's a really good uh, quality classification versus just another named classification system that's out there. So as far as spinal cord injury goes, there's really three main types of classification systems. One is one is, looks at fracture morphology. Uh, others looks at neurologic status or neurologic uh, uh, injury. And the third really combines the two into a com combo classification that I'll uh, refer to, to going forward. But uh, we'll start out by looking at some of the fracture morphology classification systems. And, you know, really, we could go on for 10 slides uh, naming all of the spinal uh, or the fracture morphology classification systems, particularly uh, throughout the 20th century that Dr. Herbert touched on a little bit earlier. But, you know, we've got McCormick Gaines or load sharing. We got Dr. Denis, and he has two classification systems when you count his um, uh, uh, sacral fracture system. Um, I'm part of the AO, and we have four classification systems. Uh, and then you've got the Allen and Ferguson. You've got occipital condyle types, dense fracture types, the Francis Levina Fendi. It goes on and on. But we'll mainly focus on the Denis and the AO classification systems as fracture morphology is concerned. So Denis, as Dr. Herbert mentioned uh, earlier, uh, the anterior two-thirds of the vertebral body are the anterior column. The posterior one-third of the vertebral body is the middle column, and everything behind that is the posterior column. It's very simple. It's easy. It's quick to use. However, 
when the ER folks start to understand it and get it, that probably means it's maybe a little bit too simple. Um, so the, when the AO classifications came into play, that was a, a big game changer, especially the more modern classification systems. Um, and so we've got the subaxial uh, classification system. We've got the, the very well-known thoracolumbar sacral, as well as uh, a C1, C2 classification system as far as fractional morphology goes. Um, you know, many of the, of the faculty, uh, here in this course were, were heavily involved with this, especially Dr. Chapman. Um, and so I know this is near and dear to his heart. Um, and just briefly, this is a, it's a tough system to learn. I've been doing this for eight years now, including training and, um, it, and you've really got to put some time and effort into understanding it, but compression injuries are type a, you've got distraction or tension band injuries, type B. Uh, translation injuries are type C. And then as it relates to subaxial cervical spine, you've got facet injuries type F. And in the interest of time, we'll kind of leave it at that for now. But some of the highlights for the AO spine classification systems, uh, they're really good at specifically identifying a fractional morphology with pretty good inner observer reliability. We, there is some back and forth sometimes about, hey, is this a B3, or is this an A3 or A4 complete or incomplete burst, et cetera. Uh, but overall, it has pretty darn good inner observer reliability. Um, and it's able to categorize the severity of each of these fractures and give us a really good idea. Um, you know, hey, is this a mild A1 or is this a, a you know, complete burst that uh, with a lot of communition involved? Um, and at the end of the day, it guides treatment for us in terms of whether or not some of these fractures need stabilization. And I think that's where the, the, the biggest highlight comes into play. Um, some cons, the AO system, it's very, as I mentioned, it's very confusing, um, and it takes a while to learn. And in fact, you know, along with their classification systems, they publish, or we have published, um, even an algorithm for how to, uh, name each of these fractures or, or how to, um, uh, where, how these letters and numbers fall into play as you're naming it. Um, and I know, uh, Jens is probably looking at me and going, Hey, this isn't a true, this isn't a fracture morphology classification. We include a neurologic, um, section as well. But, you know, the, one of the cons is that, uh, you know, the neurologic status that the AO included into this system doesn't really integrate very well. It's just, uh, one of the parts, uh, that forms the eventual sum. Um, and lastly, fractures don't always fit perfectly into these classifications. I mean, especially when you're dealing with high velocity um, uh, types of situations, uh, you can see some uh, uh, pretty crazy and pretty weird fractures, uh, multiple fractures, and then you're starting to name multiple fractures down the, the spinal column. All right, so next we'll look at some of the neurologic status or neurologic injury classification systems. So there's also quite a few of those. Uh, you've got the functional independence measure and the spinal cord in independence measure. Those are mainly used in the ambulatory setting, um, weeks, days, months after uh, spinal cord injury. And that's primarily used by our physical therapist colleagues. Um, but primarily we'll be focusing on, you know, some of the more well-known uh, neurologic injury systems. So, you know, don't forget classifying whether or not a patient is intact, incomplete or complete. That's a classification system. It's fast. It's easy. However, it's probably too simple, similar to what the Denis column, uh, uh was for us. Um, the Frankel classification, which is, which was, uh, developed, uh, some time ago, uh, that was kind of the, one of the first ones that really classified neurologic status on a, uh, along the spectrum of spinal cord injury. And if it sounds familiar, as far as decreasing severity of spinal cord injury uh, from A to E, um, well, it should, it should sound familiar uh, because that ultimately gave rise to the Asia system. Uh, but this, you know, more or less for the first time, really uh, granularly allowed us to predict outcome and prognoses with uh, spinal cord injury. So again, uh, the Frankel really kind of is what Gave, the, the modified Frankel is really what gave birth to the Asia system, which is made up of four main parts. You've got the Asia motor score, the Asia sensory score, presence or absence of voluntary anal function, and then ultimately the, the Asia impairment scale, uh, which is that decreasing severity uh, from, from A to E. Uh, we talked about this diagram a little bit earlier, um, which I'm sure 
most of us know and love, or at least told to love. Um, and uh, it's a very detailed, complex, complex exam. And so we'll, we'll review that just a little bit. Uh, but some of the highlights of the, of the Asia system, it's a highly detailed, it's level specific exam along the spinal column. It, and it really produces very granular uh, data for us in terms of our registries and our prospective studies. Um, and it provides data in an alphanumeric form, which again is very friendly when we're talking about mining lots of data for these, um, for these studies. Some of the cons, it, it's a complex exam. Um, that Asia diagram, believe it or not, I did the math a little bit when I was comparing this talk and there's 28 million possible combinations that you can go through to fill out uh, this chart. A lot of those, of course, don't make uh, anatomic sense, but uh, you get the point. The other thing that's I, I find a, a major con of, of the Asia system is that it requires if you want to participate in a in a detailed registry or if you want to participate in a prospective uh, spinal cord injury trial using the Asia system, most often you or the or your colleagues that are examining these patients, you have to be specifically certified or trained to perform this exam, and that is a major barrier um, to uh, enrolling patients in our studies. Um, and again, it's, this is a very cumbersome exam. It requires an, oftentimes an alert patient. Um, and when we're talking about polytrauma, that's often not possible. So the, the last type of classification system that we'll be talking about is those combo classifications. Um, there are fewer systems uh, just by their nature. Um, White and Punjabi, as Dr. Herbert touched on just a little bit, um, they looked at cervical spine stability in their classification and included uh, neurologic status. But really, some of the main ones that we use nowadays uh, primarily is the, is the T-LIX or the thoracolumbar injury classification score. So it's composed of three main parts, fracture morphology, which conveys immediate stability of that fracture. And it's very simple and easy, compression, burst, translation, rotation, or distraction. And there's a specific... Uh, number, to number uh, defined or uh, assigned to each one of those. And then integrity of the posterior ligamentous complex, uh, that determines more of our long-term stability and follow-up. Uh, is, is that ligamentous complex intact? Is it potentially injured or is it frankly injured? Um, and then of course the neurologic status of the, of the patient as well. Um, and that's what, I, that's what I mean by how the neurologic status in this uh, classification system really seamlessly integrates into it as opposed to the AO. Uh, so I think this is a true combo uh, classification system. And once you add up all those numbers, less than four is typically a non-surgical uh, entity. Uh, greater than four is a, a surgical patient most often. And four, uh, a value of four kind of falls into that surgeon's choice category. Dr. Hurlbert, as well as others, uh, again, um, other, other faculty in this course were, were, um, uh, develop, uh, were instrumental in developing uh, this classification system. Uh, but Dr. Hurlbert was one of my previous mentors, so I thought I'd give him a shout out. Um, and uh, the SLIC system, which we touched on a little bit earlier too, not quite as widely used, but is an analogous system uh, to the cervical spine. Um, and I thought one of the nice things that they did was uh, they, they uh, stratified incomplete cord injury and incomplete cord injury with ongoing cord compression, um, primarily because of, uh, presumably because of central cord syndrome. So TLIX and SLIC system, it's a very easy to use numerical score. It's a straightforward guide to whether or not patients uh, need surgery. And it relies, the best part is it relies on a very basic neurologic exam that we all do day to day. Uh, some of the cons, there is a little bit less inner observer reliability compared to the AO system overall. Um, and it's not best performed by other specialties. And what I mean by that is learning the integrity of the posterior ligamentous complex is a refined skill that quite frankly, traumatologists, ER physicians, um, just aren't as well adept to identifying as we are. And a lot of injuries fall on that unlucky number four, uh, where you know you, you plug in the numbers, you calculate it, and you're still stuck of whether trying to decide whether or not this patient needs surgery. And it's not a level specific uh, classification, meaning T8, T12, um, it's just all thoracolumbar. And so that really doesn't provide us with very granular data. 
So as far as what is the best path going forward for classification systems? Well, we really need to look back at our predecessors and look at their look at what their ideas were and really marry those ideas together to come up with really solid foundations for the future. And so we need to ask ourselves as spine surgeons, what are our goals going forward? Do we need or do we want to morphologically classify every single fracture that we encounter? Well, quite frankly, we've beaten that dead horse. Um, and we are really good now at assessing stability of the spinal column after a spinal uh, cord injury. Do we want to achieve data granularity at all costs? In the age of big data, um, there is a, a, a movement to have very strong, very robust classification systems, um, but is that really efficient and what we really need? And will that improve our enrollment numbers? And along, uh, as speaking of enrollment numbers, do we really wanna limit spinal cord injury, clinical and translational research to highly specialized centers? Or do we want to come up with a classification system that can spread spread that out to uh, more community-based hospitals. So what do we need? Well, we need a system that's efficient. There's more millennials in medicine than ever, myself included. And we all know that millennials have about a 10th of the attention span relative to the rest of mankind. So we've got to focus on efficient neurologic exams. And I think the way to do that is we need to focus on gross motor function below the neurologic level of injury. I just personally, I don't see a huge role for doing a C6, a very detailed C5 or C6 exam on a T8 spinal cord injury patient. And we need something that's easily calculable and that's either app-based or cloud-based that we can just plug in and go uh, to a centralized database. And we need something that's gonna be encompassing. We need, it has to be widely adoptable by all sorts of uh, uh, centers and all sorts of settings. And if we have more enrollment and if we have uh, more studies that will ultimately enhance the care of spinal cord injury. And if we achieve a better classification system and if we perform better studies, better studies are ultimately going to allow us to achieve better spinal cord injury care. So some of the things that uh, I've worked on a little bit uh, recently have been coming up with proposed alternatives for reclassifying spinal, uh, spinal cord injury. Dr. Chapman and I recently published in the Neurosurgery Clinics of North America uh, on this. And what, what we ultimately came up with was we wanted to look at cervical spinal cord injuries at C7 and above and everything else T1 and below. So what we would do in these cases is we would do a uh, uh, basic neurology exam looking at the best motor group and each limb separately. And so... For example, if you have a C4 spinal cord injury, you would do, you assess the best motor group and light touch sensation in each limb. And the max or the best score would be five in each limb. So for example, a C4 spinal cord injury patient would have a severity of six out of 20 or 12 out of, out of 20. And you would pump out a uh, level specific numerical score. Whereas Again, T1 and below, you'd only be scoring the lower extremities. So then you would have um, uh, the best possible score would be 10. So you could have a T8 level specific spinal cord injury with either three out of 10, six out of 10, um, et cetera. And that would allow us to, um, that would allow nurses, traumatologists, ER physicians, um, just about anybody that is able and willing to perform a basic neurologic exam uh, the ability to uh, classify these patients appropriately. Uh, we also looked recently at central cord syndrome. Um, it's in my opinion that central cord syndrome should not be included in any of our spinal cord, our more traditional spinal cord injury trials, just because it behaves so much differently um, uh, than more conventional spinal cord injury. So in this system, we looked at distal upper extremity, distal upper extremity motor function, and we scored each hand separately. Upper extremity sensation, lower extremity motor function, the presence or absence of urinary retention, and the presence or absence of MRI cord signal. Uh, we uh, graded each of those things uh, and assigned a point system and then added each of them up. Uh, mild central cord is seen as a score of one to five. Moderate central cord is a score of six to 10 and severe is 11 to 15. And 
Uh, based on those, you can consider either early or delayed surgery. Um, and then uh, one of the things that we that we did was we added in an instability modifier, which would of course warrant earlier surgery. So in conclusion, uh, there's an inherent value in each of the three types of spinal cord injury classification systems. Um, and we really need to start thinking about classification systems for spinal cord injury in terms of what is it gonna do for our field going forward. And new systems are gonna have to be efficient, adoptable, and ultimately enhance spinal cord injury care. Um, so as I mentioned at the beginning, it was a real honor and privilege to be back here at Swedish and the Seattle Science Foundation and, uh, and to be with two of my biggest mentors, uh, Dr. Chapman and Dr. Hobart. So thank you very much.